The now famous ivory bangle lady is perhaps the most significant individual to have emerged from the work on third century York citizens. She was discovered in 1901 in a stone sarcophagus buried in a site near Sycamore Terrace, an everyday street in the city. On one of the shards of bone had been carved the inscription Soror Ave Vivas in Deo, which translates as Hail Sister, May You Live in God, and suggests that she may have been a Christian. In her sarcophagus were a number of luxury grave goods, some blue glass beads, fragments of five bone bracelets, silver and bronze lockets, two yellow glass earrings, two marbled glass beads, a small round glass mirror, and a blue glass perfume bottle. The presence of these objects suggests that she was a woman of high social status from the upper strata of Roman York, a settlement then known as Eboracum. The most telling of her grave goods were two bracelets, one made of jet stone which probably came from Whitby on the northeast coast of England, the other made from African ivory. The geographic range from which her grave goods had been drawn was, it later proved, reflective of her own ancestry. In 2009, 16 centuries after her death, the remains of the ivory bangle lady were subjected to radioisotope analysis and precise measurements taken of her skull and skeleton. The chemical signature deposited by the food and drink she had consumed in her childhood and the measurements of her skeleton suggest that this high-status citizen of Roman York is likely to have been a mixed-race woman of North African descent, and that either she or her parents or grandparents had come from Mediterranean North Africa. She had been between 18 and 23 years old when she died, although the cause of death was unclear. Her mobility across the empire is suggestive of a woman who was connected to the Roman army as whole families moved to accompany men posted in distant provinces, and York was a significant military settlement. Relocations from the provinces in North Africa to those of Northern England were not unknown, and others have been recorded. Subsequent work on other remains is now demonstrating that Roman Britain was a society of far greater racial diversity than had been presumed. The mobility that was a feature of the late Roman Empire may well have meant that parts of 3rd century Eboracum may well have been more ethnically and racially diverse than parts of York today, in the 21st century. Another equally remarkable discovery was recently made in the seaside town of Eastbourne on the south coast of England. Again, it involved the reassessment and analysis of remains that had been excavated decades earlier, and again, an Afro-Roman woman was discovered. In 2012, local archaeologists in Eastbourne began to work their way through a collection of skeletons that had been locally excavated from the late 19th century up until the 1990s. One skeleton, almost complete, was stored in a box labelled Beachy Head by earlier generations of archaeologists. The remains were those of a young woman only around five feet tall and probably in her early 20s at the time of death, but there was little to indicate when she might have lived. The skeleton of the beachy head lady, as she was dubbed, was one of twelve sent for radioisotope analysis to determine if they had been born locally. The archaeologists, led by heritage manager Joe Seaman, arranged for a forensic facial reconstruction to be carried out by Professor Caroline Wilkinson, a leading figure in the field. Professor Wilkinson was able to tell merely by looking at the skull and before she had begun the minute measurements that underpin her work, that the skull of the beachy head lady was that of a sub-Saharan African. The process of radiocarbon dating placed the lady as having lived around A.D. 125 to 245, and the results of the radioisotope analysis confirmed that she had spent much of her childhood in the southeast of England, the beachy-haired lady was therefore a second or third century Afro-Roman who had been brought up in the south of England and had either been born in that region or was brought there very young, possibly from Africa. The radioisotope analysis also suggested that she was well-nourished in her youth, having had a diet rich in fish and vegetables. Details that were encoded in the chemicals of her teeth 
the fact that those teeth were in good condition, that she had enjoyed a healthy diet and was discovered laid out carefully in her grave, go to suggest that in life she had not served in a lowly position or lived as a slave. Over a millennium before the British people began their years of distant wandering and empire building, the beachy head lady, the first black Briton known to us, had lived and died in rural East Sussex, by the Channel Coast, with its white cliffs and green rolling hills.